like to welcome you to this tape. This is part 12 in our continuing series entitled Behind the Door. In this broadcast, we're going to be looking at another war in the 20th century called World War II. Before we analyze what went on at World War II and who was truly behind that awful war, let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that we can receive righteousness from you because we don't have any. And we're thankful that you give it to us freely to help us to overcome. Please guide us in this tape as we analyze what really went on in World War II. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we do this series on Behind the Door and we see some of the terrible things that have transpired in American history and as well in other parts of the world, we see a very, very evil and sinister power in the Jesuit order of Rome that has done these awful things. And I'm just so thankful as I produce these tapes that number one, we can really grasp what is truly going on. But at the same time, as we analyze this awful power, that we can also see the greatness and the goodness of God. That we do not have to involve ourselves or in any way shape or form be a part of this awful awful power i'm so thankful that in christ we can receive righteousness and that that righteousness can enable us to be kept from falling and i'm thankful as the psalmist david said in psalm 71 and verse 16 he said, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. It will only be through those who have the righteousness of Christ within them that they have received by faith that will enable them to resist this sinister power that we have been talking about over this entire series. Only in Christ's power can we shun these, this terrible, terrible system that has sought to destroy the knowledge of God in the earth for the last five centuries. So I'm thankful that we, like Job, as Job said in Job chapter 33 and verse 26, he said he will pray unto God and God will be favorable unto him and he will see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. I'm thankful today that God will render unto us, as he did to Job, his righteousness. That is a foreign element to us as human beings. But God in his infinite mercy extends that gift to us that we might resist the power of sin. World War II. When we think of World War II, we think of names like Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco. Maybe some of us think of that place out in the Hawaiian Islands called Pearl Harbor. Or maybe others of us think of the, some of the wars that were fought in Europe or Africa, like the Battle of the Bulge. Maybe some of us have the idea come to mind of the mushroom 
that rose up in the sky as the atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima or the one that fell on Nagasaki. It's possible that some of us went through World War II, that some of us are survivors of that time period of Earth's history. And we remember the awful Jewish Holocaust that transpired throughout Europe during that time. We all have various ways of identifying World War II. The three men that we mentioned, Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and Francisco Franco, were these men really the culprits of this awful war? Were they really responsible for the horrible events? These are going to be some of the questions that we're going to analyze in this tape of Behind the Door, Part 12. I'd like to read a few statements to you. The first one is taken from Jeremiah Crowley's book, called Romanism, A Menace to the Nation, page 144. Jeremiah Crowley, by the way, was a former Catholic priest. He states this, Popes and their Jesu Jesuitical agents have been and are the instigators of war. And while the world is having real pain, Rome is having champagne. So according to Jeremiah Crowley, the Pope and his agents are the instigators of war. And while the world is suffering and, and the world's sons are dying, sons and daughters nowadays are dying in horrible bloodbaths across the world, the Roman Catholic Church is rejoicing because they have planned and carried out the war with the sole intention of using it to bring about a one world government and reestablishing the papal power in world dominance. In another book, called Peter's Tomb Recently Discovered in Jerusalem on page 63 by a man by the name of F. Paul Peterson. We read these words. The Pope was just as much in the Second World War as was Hitler and Catholic Mussolini and therefore just as guilty of the murder of six million Jews. In fact, popes have been in or instigated most, if not all, the European wars down through the centuries. It's very clear what Mr. Peterson has declared there, that the pope was just as much involved in World War II as Hitler and Mussolini and was just as guilty of the Holocaust and Pearl Harbor and the atomic bomb and the awful battles that took place as anyone else. In Edmund Perry's book called The Vatican Against Europe, on page 48, he states this, One may say quite specifically that in 1914, the Roman Church started the series of hellish wars. It was then that the tribute of blood which she has always taken from the peoples began to swell into a veritable torrent. So according to Edmund Perry, the World War I, which began in 1914, was started by the Roman Catholic Church. They pushed Franz Joseph the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, into that war. 
And then it says that the church started the series of hellish wars. Of course, a series is a listing or several right in a row. And so World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the war in Iraq, the, the Gulf War of 1991, the Balkan War of 1997-1998, and now this war on terrorism have all been instigated and planned and plotted out by the Pope and his Jesuit agents. Now, in light of these statements, in light of these facts, it is very upsetting to hear of a very recent meeting that was held in Assisi, Italy, in which John Paul II was quoted as saying this, Violence never again. War never again. Terrorism never again again the Roman pontiff's chair has instigated and is instigating war still and John Paul II has the audacity to say such a thing as that he has the audacity to call such a meeting in Assisi as though he is interested in world peace when the Pope's chair has been guilty of all the wars of the 20th and now into the 21st century. There is currently a war going on of terrorism in America. And obviously in light of the statements we've just read, who's responsible? Is there any wonder why George Bush declared in the USA Today, September 17th of 2001, that his administration is readying a crusade against terrorism? For the student of history, t crusades were religious wars fought on behalf of papal interests. George Bush let the cat out of the bag when he made that statement in USA Today, September 17th of 2001. The war on terrorism is a crusade. It's a religious war being fought to secure papal interests in the world. When one considers Adolf Hitler, all kinds of awful things come to mind. Was he really the man who did all those awful things, or was somebody pulling his strings? I'd like to read to you from a book by Edmund Perry. This is the Vatican against Europe, and we're looking on page 15. In Germany, the papal nuncio in Berlin, Monsignor Pacelli. Monsignor Pacelli was the man who became Pope Pius XII in 1939. But in prior to that, he was the Monsignor in Germany. And Franz von Papen, the privy chamberlain to the Pope, advocated a union with Rome and concentrated on the overthrow of the Weimar Republic. The German Catholics were hostile to Nazism, but were informed that the Pope himself was favorably disposed towards Hitler. Consequently, the Catholic Zentrum, axis of all parliamentary majorities, voted full rights to Hitler on January 30, 1933. This operation was promptly followed, as in Italy, by the concluding of a concordat, which was most advantageous to the Roman Church. The German episcopate swore allegiance to the Fuhrer, and Catholic youth organizations combined with those of the Nazis. Now that's what Edmund Perry had to say in his book, The Vatican Against Europe. 
on page 15, that it was the Catholic Zentrum, a political party, a political group in Germany that voted full parliamentary rights to Hitler in 1933. And the reason they did that was because the Pope was totally behind Adolf Hitler. In another book, this one by Avro Manhattan, The Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance, which is also found, and I'm reading from a quote actually from Manhattan's book, from Sidney Hunter's book entitled Is Alberto for Real? And this quote comes from pages 42 and 43 of Hunter's book. Manhattan declares, the Vatican helped Hitler to gain power and then helped him consolidate his grip on Germany. This was done in part by advising the Catholic Party of Germany to vote for Nazi candidates. The Catholic vote gave Hitler the majority he needed to legally form a government in 1933. Further to this, the Vatican ordered Catholic members of the Reichstag Parliament to support legislation giving Hitler the power to rule by decree. This measure gave Hitler the dictatorial power he needed to destroy the German communists. The whole Vatican-Hitler bargain had been conducted in secret before Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January of 1933. In June of the same year, Hitler and the Vatican signed a concordat under terms of which the Church swore allegiance to the Nazi regime. Soon afterward, Catholic Franz van Papen, the second in command to Hitler, put the essence of the Hitler-Vatican alliance very succinctly in these words. The Third Reich, Van Papen said, is the first power which not only recognizes but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Well, Avro Manhattan is very, very clear as far as the influence of the Pope and of the Catholic Church on Adolf Hitler's rise to power. Manhattan is also very clear, and he quotes Franz von Papen specifically, who says that the Third Reich was the first power that not only recognized, but put into practice the high principles of the papacy. So the Catholic Church was in total control of Hitler's Germany. And they led Adolf Hitler to put into practice their very principles of government. From another book by Leo H. Lehman, entitled Behind the Dictators, I'm going to be reading from pages 36 and 38. Lehman says, Hitler himself admits he was helped by the methods of the Jesuit counter-reformation to carry on his ideological war. We have witnessed Catholicism's open support of every step taken by Nazi fascism to impose authoritarian regimes upon all peoples. This is something that we just do not understand. Whenever a government has a dictator or has a totalitarian regime, a, a dictator, a king, a ruler, um, today the Catholic Church is completely behind that power. We also read in that statement by Lehman, it says that Hitler admitted that he was helped by the methods of the Jesuit counter-reformation to carry on his ideological war. Now, what does that simply mean? It means this. The counter-reformation was originated at the C Council of Trent, 
1545 to 1563. And in that council, the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order determined that they would destroy the Protestant Reformation. That is known as the Council of the Counter-Reformation. So we find right here that Adolf Hitler admitted himself that he was seeking by his position as ruler of Germany to destroy Protestantism and anyone who would oppose the authority of the Pope in St. Peter's chair. A true account of history places the Catholic Jesuit menace at the very heart of the Hitler regime. It was Catholic Franz von Papen and the Catholic Zentrum Party that got Hitler into power in 1933. And to show his gratitude, Hitler's Third Reich was a model of papal principles at their worst. Hitler was a pawn in the hands of the Jesuits of Rome. Even the book that Adolf Hitler is told to have written called Mein Kampf or My Story I have read at least four different documents that state very clearly that that book was written by a Jesuit priest by the name of Father Stemple. So even the book that was attributed to Adolf Hitler was not written by him at all, but by a Jesuit, Stemple. Who was it that supported Adolf Hitler? as he waged war first in Germany with the anybody that opposed him, and then as he spread his horrors throughout Europe, who was financing all of these horrors of Adolf Hitler? I'm going to be reading from a book by H.S. Keenan entitled The Federal Reserve Bank. This is page 158 of his book. He states this. Immense sums belonging to our national bank depositors have been given to Germany on no collateral security whatever. Billions upon billions of our money has been pumped into Germany by the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. On April 27, 1932, the Federal Reserve sent $750,000 belonging to American bank depositors in gold to Germany. A week later, another 300000 in gold was shipped to Germany in the same way. About the middle of May, $12 million in gold was shipped to Germany by the Federal Reserve Banks. Almost every week there is a shipment of gold to Germany. Now what did we find in a few recent broadcasts, the one on the Titanic and World War I? We found that the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve System, was started by the Rothschilds, the Morgans, and the Rockefellers. And we found from F. Tupper Saucy's book called Rulers of Evil that the Rothschilds held the keys to the Vatican treasury. And we found that J.P. Morgan's clan and the Rockefellers were all supporters and all agents of the Rothschilds here in America. And so we find then that the Federal Reserve System was founded and got off the ground by these Jesuit agents. And what they did was, is they took American dollars and they were sending it to a madman in Europe during World War II to help him carry on the papal plan of annihilation 
and destruction of anybody who would oppose the authority of the Pope. And so the Federal Reserve, run by Americans in America, but doing things that are totally un-American. Why? Because those Americans are marching to the tune of a different drummer. Those Americans are not working for America. They're not working for the goals and purposes of America and what America stands for. Those rulers in the early 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Congress and the Federal Reserve System, they were all working for Rome. And so they were supporting Rome's man in Germany, Adolf Hitler. In light of Keenan's statement, it is only makes sense that a Jesuit-controlled bank would fund a Jesuit-controlled puppet. And that's exactly what Adolf Hitler was. So all the crimes, all the atrocities of the concentration camps, all attributed to Adolf Hitler, in reality, all originate in the Vatican. From Jesuit-controlled Germany and Adolf Hitler, let's turn to the country of Spain and Francisco Franco. Spain was going through, let's take a look, brief look at some history here. They were going through convulsions toward the end of the 1800s. Spain was going back and forth between a Roman Catholic monarchy and an attempt at republican government. Finally, in the 1930s, bodies of little babies were discovered under several convents. Doctors discovered that these infants had died as the result of being suffocated at birth. You see, nuns and priests had engaged in relations and the unwanted babies were killed. The Catholic people of Spain, who knew nothing of these awful crimes, were outraged by the discoveries. Laws were passed that hindered the papacy's power in Spain. And so, according to ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera, he says this, and this can be found in the Alberto series, parts 1, 3, and 6. They all carry information about the Spanish Revolution, and that's found in a, an assortment of pages in those different parts. But Alberto Rivera says this, in 1936, the new Spanish Inquisition exploded. It was called the Spanish Civil War, secretly orchestrated in the Vatican. The Pope excommunicated the heads of the Spanish Republic and declared war between the Holy See and Madrid. Under the banner of the Vatican, the Muslim forces invaded the Canary Islands and then attacked southern Spain. When the Inquisition accomplished its goal, Spain was in ruins, bleeding and beaten, but safely back in the hands of the Vatican. General Franco eventually became the Roman Catholic dictator of Spain. Franco's government was recognized August 3, 1937 by the Vatican, just 20 months before the Civil War ended. So Alberto Rivera shows clearly that Francisco Franco was working for the Pope to restore the Pope's power in Spain. At this point in our tape, Let's turn it over and continue with Behind the Door, Part 12. I'd like to welcome you to side two of this tape of Behind the Door, Part 12. A look at World War II and who was really behind it. We finish Part 1 with a look at Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain, and who was behind Franco? We're going to continue on looking at Franco a little bit longer.
from a book by the name of The Devil's Masterpiece, The Mystery of Iniquity, written by Albert Garner, pages 70 and 71. It says, When Franco marched on Madrid during the close of the late civil war in Spain, when he was reinstating the Catholic government and overthrowing the people's government that the Protestants had set up a few years before, he said, I have four columns of soldiers with me. I also have a fifth column in the city of Madrid who will betray the city into my hands when I get there. Finally, from Edmund Perry's book, The Vatican Against Europe, page 15, it says on March 31, 1934, the Pact of Rome was signed and pledged support of Mussolini and Hitler for the rebellion. The Holy War broke out. In 1937, in the midst of war, the Vatican gave de jure recognition to the government of Franco, its sword bearer, who was later to be decorated with the supreme order of Christ. Blessed be the guns if the gospel flowers in their wake. Soon the Catholic a action was to spread its tyranny across the ruined country. Both Garner and Peri have completely agreed with Alberto Rivera in his analysis of Spain and Francisco Franco. Franco was a tool of Rome. He destroyed the attempts at a Republican government in Spain. And of course, the rest of Spanish history is just that. It's history. The Vatican Jesuit agent Francisco Franco used Muslims to overthrow the Protestant thinking Catholics of Spain. It's very interesting that Muslims were used by the Vatican to help Francisco Franco to destroy the attempts by the Catholics of Spain to have a Republican government. In the Balkan Wars in the late 1990s, Muslims, Osama bin Laden, they were used to fight in the battle over in Kosovo. They were used by the Roman Catholic Croatians to fight against the Orthodox Serbs. Is it possible that the Vatican Jesuit scheme today is to use Osama bin Laden and the extremist Muslims to overthrow Protestant thinking people of America? In, all, in light of all that has been shown, this certainly is the case. Benito Mussolini was certainly considered highly by the Jesuits. He was their man of providence. He was the one who restored the land of Vatican City to the papacy in 1929. According to Edmund Perry's book, again on page 15, it says, what was happening in Europe between the two massacres? In Italy, secret negotiations took place between papal agents and Mussolini, the man of providence. The priest Don Sturgio, chief of the Catholic group, had full rights voted to the Duce or Mussolini on November 1922. Then came the Lateran Treaty to seal the union of fascism and the papacy, the conquest of Ethiopia blessed by the clergy, clergy, and on Good Friday 1939, the aggression against Albania. According to Pope Pius XI in the same book on page 69, Mussolini is making rapid headway and will conquer all in his path. Mussolini is a wonderful man. Do you hear me? A wonderful man. The future is his. And finally, in a book called Days of Our Years by Pierre von Passen, we read this. For today, Rome considers the fascist regime the nearest to its dogmas and interest. 
We have not merely the Reverend Jesuit Coughlin praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but civil, Civilta Catolica, the house organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Well, in Germany, Franz von Papen, we read a little while ago, said that the, Pape, the Third Reich was the first government to put into practice the high principles of the papacy. Well, now here the Civilta Catolica, the house organ, a magazine of the Jesuit order, said that fascism most closely corresponds to the concepts of the Church of Rome. So both these powers, Germany and Italy, that wreaked such havoc for so long in the 1930s and 40s, were simply carrying out orders and carrying out the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't just these three Axis powers, though, with their Catholic puppets that did Rome's bidding during World War II. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, also carried out Rome's wishes. In just a few statements here, I want to show you how Roosevelt worked right hand in hand with the papacy through the Second World War. The first statement I'm going to read is from a book by John Cooney called The American Pope on pages 124 and 125. We read these words. Cardinal Francis Spellman, the man who was instrumental, the man who was behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963, was offered by Franklin Roosevelt an unprecedented opportunity that would necessitate leaving his archdiocese for months on end. The astounding proposal put forth by Roosevelt was that Spellman act as a clandestine agent for him in the four corners of the world. It would be the archbishop's job to contact chiefs of state in the Middle East, Europe, Asia, and Africa. He would carry messages for the president and act as Roosevelt's eyes and ears. The president offered him an opportunity to wield more power than any other American religious figure had ever had. Spellman would move as an equal among the greatest figures on the world political stage. Few people were certain about what the archbishop did during his far-flung travels. His clandestine work raised questions at home about the role of a religious figure involved deeply in governmental affairs. Now we need to understand that Francis Spellman's first allegiance was to Pope Pius XII, and yet he was used by Franklin Roosevelt as his own personal agent. We also read of Franklin Delano Roosevelt these words from the book The Unseen Hand, written by Ralph Epperson, page 301. Roosevelt and Eisenhower approved of the forced repatriation of some six million Orthodox people back to Russia, many of whom were tortured or killed after they reached their destination. Two Russians who have written about this abominable decision of these American leaders are Nikolai Tolstoy and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The Americans called this repatriation Operation Neil Hall, after the naval form of punishment or torture where the prisoner is hauled under the keel of a ship by a rope tied to the prisoner's body. These six million individuals were not only soldiers who had fought on the side of the Germans against the Russians, but they were women and children as well. Even though 
It was Churchill and Roosevelt who made these incredible decisions to repatriate millions of anti-communist Russians back to certain death. It was General Dwight Eisenhower who enforced Operation Keel Hall with no apparent pangs of consciousness. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt not only used Francis Spellman as his agent, but carried out the Jesuits' goal of annihilating as many Orthodox Christians as possible. The Jesuits had sought to destroy the Orthodox Christians of Serbia in World War I. Now they would seek to destroy Orthodox Christians of Russia too. Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and Churchill carried out the Jesuits' bloody plan to a T. What were some of the goals, now that we've looked at some of the key players, what were some of the goals that the Jesuits hoped to accomplish by World War II? One was the destruction of the Orthodox Church in Russia. We read in Edmund Perry's book, The Vatican Against Europe, pages 240 and 241. It says, Count Hulk von Leduchowski, the Jesuit general, was disposed to organize a degree of collaboration between the German Secret Service and the Jesuit order. Von Ledochowski considered the forthcoming settling of accounts between Russia and German, Germany as inevitable. One of the questions arising from German activity in Russia, which is of the utmost importance to the Vatican, is the question of the evangelization of Russia. And that was according to one of Ledochowski's aides. So we see here very clearly in Paris' book that the Jesuit general was collaborating with Hitler to evangelize Russia. And what that simply meant was to destroy the Orthodox Church and to make Russia Catholic. While the Orthodox Christians of Russia were being wiped out, there was a similar annihilation going on in Yugoslavia. Many books have been written about this atrocity of World War II. Convert or Die by Edmund Perry, The Vatican's Holocaust by Avril Manhattan, and Ravening Wolves by Monica Farrell. All three of these books discuss the murder of at least one million Orthodox Christians during World War II by the Catholic Eustachy. On the cover of Farrell's book, we read, this is the record of torture and murder committed in Europe in 1941 to 1943 by an army of Catholic actionists known as the Eustachy, led by monks and priests and even participated in by nuns. The victims suffered and died in the cause of liberty and freedom of conscience. The least we can do is to read the record of their sufferings and keep in mind that it happened not in the dark ages, but in our enlightened generation. Eustachy is another name for Catholic action. As Monica Farrell brought out so clearly in this statement, we have the idea that what went on through the Dark Ages is confined to the Dark Ages. But according to Farrell's book, over a million Orthodox Christians were slain during World War II in our enlightened era. In another book called Holocaust in the Independent State of Croatia by a gentleman by the name of Lazo Kostic, on page 18, we read these words. The mass expulsion or forced conversion of the Orthodox to Roman Catholicism was on the agenda. All measures aiming at the elimination of Serbdom in Croatia were carried out under the slogan enunciated by one of the Croatian ministers. 
We shall massacre the first third of the Serbs, expel the second third from the country, and force the final third to accept the Catholic faith, whereby they will be absorbed by the Catholic element. So it was massacre a third of the Serbs. The Serbs were Orthodox Christians. The Croatians were Catholic. They were going to expel the second third and force the final third to embrace Catholicism. What happened at the end of the 1990s in Kosovo with Slobodan Milosevic, who is currently on trial over in the Balkan states over in Yugoslavia that was done to further annihilate the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church in the late 1990s used NATO the North Atlantic Treaty Organization they used the United Nations they used the United States they used Osama bin Laden to destroy the heart of the Serbian Orthodox people in the late 1990s. Another goal of World War II was to make things so bad for the Jews that they would want to return to Palestine. Near the end of World War I, the Balfour Declaration was signed enabling the Jews to go back home to Palestine. This was to be their permanent home. But many Jews had found success in various parts of the earth, and they didn't want to go back to the land on the eastern side of the Mediterranean. Along comes World War II and the Jewish Holocaust. The Jews, battered and persecuted, long for a place to call home. And it's already waiting for them. In 1948, Israel was declared to be a sovereign nation. And according to John Cooney's book again, entitled The American Pope, on page 187, Cooney tells us that Francis... Spellman, the Catholic Archbishop of the New York Diocese, which is the most powerful diocese in the United States, that Spellman had been the deciding factor in getting Israel accepted as a sovereign state. Now that poses an interesting thought. Why would the Jesuits use Adolf Hitler to annihilate the Jews and then use another man, Cardinal Spellman, who would vote favorably for the Jews to return to Palestine? They're playing both ends of the spectrum. What is going on here? Let's keep in mind now that the Vatican has wanted to destroy the Jews for over a millennium. We read from Avril Manhattan's book called The Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance, pages 169 and 170, these words. Behind the Zionist or Jewish banner, there was to be found the ancient messianic hope for the coming of a global theocracy, as predicted by all the seers and prophets of Zion. It was to be a theocracy in which Jehovah, not Christ, was to be king. The specter of the creation of such a theocracy has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception. In Vatican eyes, the yearning for a global Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatological teachings of the Catholic Church. In the public eye, Palestine seemed to be so wonderful for the Jews to be able to have a home. But what has been the result of the Jews returning to Palestine? Since being granted 
sovereign s status in 1948, the Jews have been in one war after another. If it wasn't with Egypt, it was with Syria or Lebanon or Iraq or the PLO. War has raged for decades. Many Jews have died just as the Jesuits hoped and knew would happen. The ultimate goal of the Jesuits for the Jews being returned to Palestine is to create such bloodshed in that part of the world so that the people of the Middle East and all the world would then cry out for somebody to come to that region and bring peace. And so the Jesuits have created a problem. They've created bloodshed and terror in the Middle East for decades now. And soon it's going to get even worse over there than it is right now. Having created the problem, they will then bring forth a solution to the problem. And what will the solution be? We need a peacemaker in this part of the world. And who will that peacemaker be? It will be the Pope of Rome. The Jesuits have wanted to restore the Pope's temporal power since their very beginnings at the Council of Trent. And when the Pope is given Solomon's chair in Jerusalem, this will bring to fruition their long-awaited purpose. The war on terrorism that began September 11, 2001, which George Bush calls a crusade, could certainly elevate trouble in that region to bring about the reign of the pontiff right in the heart of Jerusalem. Another goal of World War II, after World War I, the Jesuits had attempted to create a world governing body called the League of Nations, but it failed. But after World War II, they had done all of their groundwork of conditioning the American people to accept such an idea. And so after the war, the weary, aching world was ready for an international body and the United Nations was born. Do you see how World War II happened? The Jesuits created the war to carry out certain goals. And once the war was over, they had a perfect solution for the problem. Enter the United Nations. As you look at the record of the United Nations since 1945, we find that instead of being a peacekeeping body, it has been used to suppress liberty-loving people and to crush nations. We find Katanga and Rhodesia as two examples of nations that were crushed by UN forces. The United Nations has certainly worked toward restoring the temporal power of the papacy, its sole purpose from the beginning. Finally, we will look at one other goal of World War II. It was payback time for the Japanese. You see, in the late 1500s, the Japanese had welcomed all foreigners who wanted to trade with her. Catholic missionaries and other missionaries had been welcomed too. But after a time, the Catholic missionaries had become intolerant of other people's beliefs. Unrest and persecution resulted, and Japan became a bloodbath for decades. Finally, in 1639, an edict was passed called the Exclusion Edict. And according to Avro Manhattan's book entitled Vietnam, Why Did We Go? On page 153, he states this, The edict 
stated that for the future let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even in the quality of ambassadors. And this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death. The exclusion edict was to drive away all foreigners, all missionaries of every ilk, as long as the sunshine would rise in the eastern sky. That happened in 1639. Finally, in about 1854, the ports of Japan were finally opened. Military power began to be exerted against this island nation. This softened Japan up until the awful bloody conflict in the South Pacific, culminating in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, brought her to her knees and tragically forever. Payback had come to the Japanese who had dared to drive the Jesuits out of Japan for nearly 200 years. I feel we've just scraped the surface in this tape. There's so much more that could be said, but we need to close. May we thank God as we close in prayer that we can look away from ourselves. We can look away from the evil empires of the Vatican, of America, and other nations. And we can receive the righteousness of Christ that will prepare us to live in His wonderful kingdom of peace. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank You that this world is not our home, that we're just a passing through. If heaven weren't our home, O oh Lord, what would we do? After looking at this material, we realize that the papacy's agenda is right on schedule. We pray that you would strengthen us to stand for thy eternal truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until we meet again and look at Behind the Door Part 13. May God bless you.